Right, hello everybody. This is our class in the anthropology of law. Now, formally, officially, the class is called Law and Society, which is a discipline more generic and encompassing than the anthropology of law. We shall be looking at various texts which cover both. The anthropology of law as a distinct specialized field and also a, a works from the field which we define as law and society. Now, in this class, which is for students in anthropology at the University Shandong, at Shandong University in China, in this class, I shall be looking at some works which lay the foundations of law, or more precisely, they lay the foundations in the anthropology of law. A crucial phase or a formative period which I established in my introductory lecture, which I uh, mentioned in my introductory lecture, in my introductory lecture was, was a period starting from the 1920s and developing through the 1930s, 1940s, until the 1960s or 70s, when anthropologists of law were interested in studying political and legal systems or concepts of law and politics within indigenous societies. Therefore, the scope of the fieldwork was quite limited. Nonetheless, this, this scholarship has its merits and it constitutes the foundation in the discipline of anthropology as a whole, exactly because these scholars gave very detailed descriptions about the legal customs and the various legal and political systems of organization in various indigenous societies, ranging from the Indians of the United States to the more exotic and stateless societies in Papua New Guinea, in the Philippines, in Africa and in other societies also. I should mention that there is a, there is a very interesting literature on uh, Russia, on Siberia, which also documents the, the traditional legal customs, what we call customary law in various indigenous societies, the Avanki or the Tuvans or Buryatia and other societies, perhaps in contrast to this scholarship, which we shall be looking at, studies by Paul Buchanan, for instance, one does not find that there is a distinct body of scholarship which covers the kinds of customary law in native Siberia, but there is plenty of information on the various legal customs which were applied to particular offenses. So um, there is research which shows that there was an explicit body of rules among natives in the Tuva region, in the wider Sayan Altai region. And this body of rules was applicable to various offenses um, according to the magnitude of the offense committed on uh, every occasion. Right, so um, I, I plead for your understanding if there are various breaks and pauses uh, and various disruptions. That's because I am recording this session and um, inevitably there is some noise around me, uh, not very often, but I do hope that I shall be able to, um, uh, to continue without any disruptions and without any problems. Right, yes. So the proper title of this course is Foundations of Law. The major reading which I'm using for this lecture comes from this book, comes from this book, 
It is called Law and Warfare Studies in the Anthropology of Conflict. It is edited by Paul Bohanan, who is a very well-known figure in the scholarship in the ethnology of law, in studies, in anthropological studies of law. I shall read a few titles from this excellent work. It is a classic in legal anthropology. For instance, on page 161, we find Barton's paper, which is entitled Procedure Among the Ifugao, Procedures of Settling Disputes. The Ifugao are a, an indigenous group in the Philippines, and the paper documents the range of procedures or the procedure as such, the procedure of dealing with various disputes. Also, another interesting paper among the many interesting papers in this volume by Adamson Hebel, a well known name in the classical scholarship. Uh, in the anthropology of law, the paper is entitled, <clears throat> excuse me, the paper is entitled Low Ways of the Comanche Indians. I shall be referring to some examples from um, tribal Indian societies, where we shall find out that there were indigenous societies which were military in their purposes. They offered protection to the community and at the same time, they uh, had been assigned various policing functions. Therefore, they, uh, I take this to mean that the boundaries between warfare and policing were not always um, as straightforward as we tend to imagine them on the basis of our own experience of what constitutes law and how law is officially juxtaposed to activities which are um, uh, unlawful or which violate the law of the state. I shall be referring to the institutions of the state in a while, although this is not going to be the major topic of my talk in this evening. It's evening time in Greece um, uh, at this moment. Uh, I shall be referring to Western concepts of the law as these are seen from an anthropological perspective in my forthcoming discussion of another important book by a very well-known legal anthropologist Simon Roberts, a book which is entitled Order and Dispute, Order and Dispute, an introduction to legal anthropology. If one reads, if one reads the introduction, one finds that the author presents a very compelling argument about the applicability of the term law to indigenous societies. Basically, he claims, and perhaps I'm oversimplifying his argument, which is quite complex, that law is the, the most effective instrument of holding the absolute kind of power, the absolute sense of authority in Western societies. And in this sense, law occurs only within institutional, only within institutional frames, which are unique to Western Anglo-European societies, as, for example, courts of law and specialists in redressing, in redressing conflicts and in solving disputes. Moreover, he says that people go to specialized courtrooms, which are especially designated for these functions. And therefore, it is no good generalizing on the basis of legal customs, which might be associated with Western countries. Nonetheless, they're still parochial customs. If one looks into indigenous societies, one finds that there were no such formal institutions for redressing conflicts and solving disputes, but the outcome was more or less the same as people were coerced to comply to um, the perceived normative conduct or um, through some kind of negotiation 
a settlement of a dispute was achieved, as for instance, among various indigenous African societies where specialists functioned as, as a sort of go-between, as a sort of mediator between the disputing parties. Yes, all right. Let me just read a few more titles from this collection of essays. Max Gluckman, a, a famous Africanist, anthropologist, an anthropologist of Africa. He is very well known for his works on politics, um, re religion, ritual, and customary law. Of course, the work which is more related to our discussion is his book, The Judicial Process Among the Barotze, a work where Max Gluckman establishes um, that, or he, he proposes that the judicial system of the Lotzi in Zambia, the part of the Barotze peoples, was as rational as the European court systems. Right, so we shall be referring to um, the, the foundations in the study of law. Perhaps I did not mention the title uh, by the paper by Adamson, the title of the paper by Adamson Hebel, Adamson Hebel, Song Duels Among the Eskimo. And the author of the text, which we shall consider in this week, Robert Redfields also discusses this case among the Eskimo, there is various song duels, as an alternative to a more pragmatic and official ways of solving disputes. Song duels among the Eskimo, a sort of competition between those who were engaged in a dispute and which is uh, negotiated or is revisited in the context of performance and perhaps even in the context of ritual. One interesting aspect which we shall encounter, I hope, in the process, I hope that I shall uh, mention this as well, is that ritual, religion and the supernatural appears to be an important function in terms of um, of, of, of procedures of solving disputes in indigenous societies. The supernatural engages, or the supernatural emerges in the form of an automatic kind of revenge, an automatic kind of retribution, which is, um, which is directed at those violating some basic religious offenses. And also it emerges in the form of oaths and various vows, religious vows, which people must undertake in the process of an ordeal for discovering the cause of a collective affliction, of a collective misfortune. Right, a nice example which relates to the latter orientation, to the latter definition of the supernatural is provided by ethnographic examples of incest, of incestuous relationships, and how a shaman undertakes to shed light on such transgressions by means of interrogating members of the community, and also by means of um, compelling these peoples or the suspects to undertake an oath, an oath which uh, uh, which incurs a sort of supernatural punishment if one is lying. A, a Danish explorer, his name is Knud Rasmussen, provides such descriptions in his works on the Iglulik and the Inuit Eskimos, including the, in, yes, the Inuit, if I am right. But this concerns the, uh, the ethnography of the Eskimo peoples in uh, the Arctic part of Canada. Right, so given that this text is quite complex and not easy to read, I shall, um, I shall read some parts from this exposition. I hope that this text is visible here. 
I am sharing the screen through Zoom and I have isolated some parts of the text which I think are quite important. You can see the, the front cover of the book on the right hand side, Law and Warfare, Law and Warfare Studies in the Anthropology of Conflict by edited by Paul Bohannon. Right, so I am referring to the text by Robert Redfield, which is called Primitive Law. It is very rich in ethnographic cases, in ethnographic examples, which offer a wide definition of legal customs and various procedures in societies very diverse. Robert Redfield discusses cases from societies which are more centralized or more politically organized than other societies which are stateless. And he finds that we can identify some differences between these examples. Of course, law is defined in different ways from one society to another, always referring to indigenous societies. And at the same time, we find that some institutions are more coercive in societies which are more centralized and more politically organized societies. But we should start by making a basic, a fundamental distinction between two kinds of law. I have summarized this part of the, of the text of the exposition in this first screen in this first slide which you see. So we can draw a distinction between two different kinds of law as they are meant in the scholarship. We can refer to law as a kind of, as a set of principles of written rules which are applied to various cases and these cases are dealt with by courts of law. Therefore, in this first fundamental sense of the term, the law is related to the politically organized states. Law is repressive and it is applicable to uh, each one of us, to all citizens of a, a centralized state. Law can't be negotiated nor it can be used by uh, particular individuals uh, uh, in order to serve individual benefits. Of course, as Simon Roberts writes in his book, which I have introduced briefly, the book which is called Order and Dispute, in modern constitutions there are clauses which uh, mention that law is independent. This is rendered as the independence of the law and of the judiciary also. Law is sacred and it is independent. Now, the extent to which law is um, essentially, um, factually independent is up for discussion, but this is the official definition of the law which governments owed to respect. So in this first sense, law is associated with institutions. But of course, we find that various ideas about normativity, about normative behavior are also present in stateless, non-centralized societies. It is worth paying attention to an interesting definition which is offered by Malinowski in his work, Crime and Custom in Savage Society. I'll stay, he I'll stay here for a couple of minutes, perhaps for one or two minutes. Malinowski defines law as an instrument which is used in order to control human drives and instincts, instincts instincts referring to the human nature which has to be checked and contained and in this way the purpose and the function of the law is to protect the citizens rights to property and safety of course this is a rather generic definition and it 
and it equally applies to indigenous societies or stateless societies and to political societies, which we know from our own experience. Further on, Malinowski defines law as a kind of social control. And this is an argument which um, has been developed in studies of law in indigenous societies, in stateless societies. According to this perspective, law or whatever institutions and ideas are equivalent to law function as a kind of policing or they are equivalent to policing in modern societies. Law is a, an instrument for social control. Now, of course, as I mentioned, one does not find that in indigenous societies there have been complex legal systems and institutions which are comparable to law courts, excluding, of course, some societies where um, what we can define as rudimentary legal structures and law courts and courts of law did exist as the Barotze, who had a developed legal system, which survived and um, was ongoing under British colonial jurisdiction. Now, as Malinowski says, any ideas related to social control include effective social institutions of exercise and coercion. Therefore, one does find that institutions or processes, procedures of coercion do exist also in many of these indigenous societies whose legal customs have been studied. Malinowski refers especially to ideas which, as he claims, lead to results which are similar to what one finds in modern societies. He develops this argument in his book, which is called Crime and Custom in Savage Society, which I mentioned. And he identifies two principles, which, as he argues, are integral in this normative system. These principles are called, are defined by Malinowski as reciprocity and publicity. There is good publicity and there is also negative publicity. A person who avoids sharing foods or cooperating in fishing, in fishing expeditions, um, and who appears to be withdrawn or who avoids any social interaction is excluded from the network of social relationships, which is indispensable for survival in such a community as the Trobriand Islanders who live, whose life depends on fishing, on growing potatoes, young potatoes or vegetables or, or any other social activity which is based on collaboration. Further on, Malinowski writes that law includes any norm of conduct, conformity, which is baited with inducements. Let me just go to page four and perhaps draw out some ideas and some further, um, um, some further arguments, some further uh, ideas on that. Yes, of course, this sense of law is more personalized and more individualistic because Malinowski refers also to personal motivations and to various social advantages and disadvantages which um, are important in, in making an individual um, uh, deciding which kind of behavior is appropriate. Right, let me just read a very short passage from the paper by Redfield, which refers to Malinowski's definition of the law. He writes, Redfield writes, this conception, this conception, and 
This refers to the conception of social control, where individuals are induced to do what people expect of them. This conception requires us to include under law any norm of conduct conformity to, to which is, as Malinowski puts it, baited with inducements. So the law includes a wide range of rules and conditions or norms of conduct conformity to which, uh, yes, yes, uh, which are baited with inducements. Therefore, in a sense, we can include any kinds of a normative principle which individuals are coerced to follow or to abide by, not necessarily because there is an official system of surveillance, but because people will suffer. Uh, if they disobey this order, or if they do not collaborate, if they appear to be, if they appear to be uncooperative. And I continue reading this, a couple of sentences. If we take this road, we find ourselves concerned with all the complicated and varying considerations of personal motivation and social advantage or disadvantage which are involved in deciding to do or not to do what people expect of us. Following him down this road, following Malinowski down this road, one has not too little to talk about, but far too much. Yes, apparently this latter definition of the law is more inclusive of kinds of normativity, which are not based on an external system of repression. Therefore, this is an interesting definition of law, which uh, includes also kinds of jurisdiction or kinds of power, simply kinds of power, which are not based, which are not dependent on the presence of a government or on the presence of police officers or any other kind of system of enforcing the law. Now, Malinowski's example, or the one which I would like to mention, and which further corroborates this argument, which further confirms this, confirms this, confirms this argument, comes from a book, which I do not currently have, which I left in my library, in my library back in China, a book by Sally Falk Moore, which is an introductory book in legal anthropology. Let me see how much time I've used so far, because I think that there are some limitations in recording through Zoom. But in any case, um, the author of this textbook on law and anthropology presents an example from Malinowski's ethnography, which is very interesting, and which shows that the rule of traditional commands is as powerful as the repressive sanctions which we associate with a contemporary legal systems. This concerns the case of a chief, a powerful chief in the community of Omarakana among the Trobrians, Islanders. This was a village where Malinowski was staying. And this case concerns a sort of conflict which was not just legal, but also psychological. Among the Trobrians, a chief is supposed to pass down his office to his nephew, not to his own biological son, because as I remember having mentioned in the previous class, according to the kinship system of the Trobrian peoples, it is not the biological father who is responsible for bringing up his own child, but it is the uncle, the maternal uncle. So Malinowski presents a case of a leader who was psychologically divided between this um, official principle of the community, between who was psychologically divided between this official principle and his own desire for um, privileging his own son. 
So this case ended in a dramatic way as Malinowski describes in his book. Finally, the chief was forced to leave the community. He lost his office and they legitimate Heir to this position, the legitimate successor uh, to this position um, emerged victorious. He finally prevailed. Malinowski takes this as an example, which shows that the O, the O, A, W, E, the O, the respect for traditional command came to be very powerful and finally prevailed uh, in this community. Traditional, the traditional custom prevailed over individual desire. Right, yes, so we keep this definition by Malinowski. We start with this as a baseline and we shall find out what meanings of, what ethnographic meanings of law emerge in the process when we look into some other examples. I, sh I, I will just read again this short sentence because it is important to remember this. Law therefore includes any norm of conduct, conformity, which is baited with inducements. And this is where law or this definition of the law is connected to individual interests. People design and regulate their individual conducts in relation to people who are socially significant or socially important to them, powerful members of a family or a genealogy or a kinship system or powerful academics in cases where one, where a person is, let's say, part of a hierarchical system or people regulate their behavior within any social system, which is based on uh, hierarchical notions of power and, and evolution and, and development and progress. Right, uh, yes, further on, there are some interesting um, sentences which relate to this basic argument by Malinowski. Excuse me, just one minute, please. Uh, right, yes. Now the author, Robert Redfield, further refers to conventionalized relationships between members of a society in restricting the impulses of human nature and in bringing about established modes of conduct. This is an important subject, yes. In this more extensive definition of law, as we use it in the context of indigenous societies, we find that there are all kinds of conventionalized, of conventionalized relationships between members of primitive society. These relationships are intended to restrict impulses and to bring about the established modes of conduct. Yes, right. Now, Redfield defines law in complex Western states as follows. And I am mentioning this as a point of juxtaposing, of comparing this former definition of the law with what happens in modern complex states. Therefore, let's see what Redfield defines as law in complex societies. He says that law is the systematic and formal application of force by the state in support of explicit rules of conduct. This is on pages four and five. Yes, law involves the explicit force of rules. And this points to a difference, perhaps, between the Western models of law and jurisprudence and indigenous senses of normativity and normative conducts. I shall read a few more lines from Radfield's definition of 
low in complex societies. Like other institutions, like other institutions, low is represented on two sides, as Sumner said. Apparently, he refers to Henry Sumner Maine or to another author. This, that I do not know. But in any case, yes, low is represented on two sides. Concept and structure. The concept consists of the principles and the rules restricting or requiring action. It is characteristic of low, it is characteristic of low that these develop an explicitness and internal consistency and that the maintenance and development of this internal organization becomes to the society or at least to the lawyers an objective in itself. The structure of the law is of course chiefly process and courts. This is a very interesting definition of law because it identifies the distinctive features of law in complex societies. Law is systematic or it involves a systematic application of rules by force, by means of legitimate force by state agencies. It involves explicit rules of conduct. These rules are applied for the purposes of the social order and they are internally consistent. There is, they cannot be applied in different ways or perhaps the same interpretation of laws is um, expected uh, no matter where the law is applied to, no matter of the case study where the law is applied to. Moreover, a major objective, a major objective of the law is the maintenance of this internal consistency as this happens in politically organized societies. Further on, Redfield identifies the distinctive features of law in complex societies. Process, court, law is found in institutional contexts as courts of law. Further on, law signifies compliance with rules. Apparently, these um, these legal rules can't be negotiated, legal agreements cannot be changed in many cases, or this can happen, um, uh, this can happen on pain of a, um, of, of a penalty imposed on those uh, intending to change a formal contract. Moreover, law is associated with punishments and with compensation which is um, which uh, should be commensurate with the kind of the offense which has been committed. The court of law will um, evaluate what the uh, particular kind of uh, compensation applies to each case. So law, and perhaps I forgot to mention the most explicit feature of the law in complex societies, law is all about punishments or the threat of punishments emerges when law is broken. Now, perhaps we should not take this distinction between primitive societies or indigenous societies or stateless societies and complex societies for granted because uh, what the author does in this text is to focus on the elementary forms of judicial procedures in indigenous societies. And his purpose is to show that some kind of continuity is observable, continuity between the um, customs of order and, and organization in indigenous societies and what happens in modern political societies, in, in, in complex organized societies. Therefore, the author argues that 
one finds in indigenous societies some fundamental kinds of conduct which anticipate the law in complex, literate, political societies. I find this a very interesting argument because it shows that indigenous peoples can be also legalistic. They can be concerned with the interpretation of their own customs and rules. And um, they, they are concerned or they were concerned in the past with the interpretation of the law as such in their own contexts, of course. Therefore, we shall be looking at some examples, some ethnographic cases which, um, which offer documentation of the foundations of what we call law. It is important to um, clarify this and to establish this from the very beginning, that we shall be looking at various proto-legal customs. There is customs which contain the, um, the basic, the fundamental elements of a legal system, although in a very rudimentary form. So forms of conduct in similar societies anticipate the law in complex literate political societies, as I mentioned in this um, image, in this part of the exposition. I hope that the PowerPoint is visible and that um, uh, you do actually, uh, you do actually see this, right? Yes. Now, these are some classic works in the anthropology of law. On the right, on the left hand side, this is another classic by Paul Buchanan, who is, as I mentioned, the editor of the book which I'm using for this lecture. Excuse me, right? Yes, fine. The book is called Justice and Judgment Among the Teeth in Nigeria. One interesting feature, uh, one feature which uh, I find quite interesting from this work is that Bohanan says that the teeth people are quite, are litigious. They are very much interested in, um, in dealing with cases of disputes and with how these disputes can be settled. This is something which the author of the text, which we are reading also notes. Robert Redfield says, um, writes, uh, writes that uh, African societies are litigious and that legal customs are quite developed or were quite developed in these indigenous societies, or people were very much concerned with uh, interpreting cases and with participating in collective, um, collective contexts where people gathered together, where people uh, tried to sort out disputes. Now, another author whom Redfield mentions is Siegel and it is interesting to mention what he says about the problem of primitive law. Siegel frames the problem of defining primitive law um, by means of the following way. There is the purpose for legal scholars, for anthropologists interested in law, should be to discern, to discern in the absence of a full political organization and juridical institutions, certain modes of conduct which can be segregated from the general body of conduct as incipiently legal. I will stay here for a couple of seconds. Excuse me. Yes, therefore, According to this argument, the purpose of legal anthropology should be to identify a body of rules which are incipiently 
legal a body of rules which does exist in the absence of political organization and also in the absence of courts of law. One moment, please. Yes. This definition by Siegel allows us to include under the category of law both the sort of rules and conditions which people have to follow in order to um, in order to gain some advantage or to uh, repress any kind of disadvantage but also it includes the sort of modern concepts of the law which uh, involves a sort of systematic or coercive set of principles, which is what law is in the modern sense of the term. Right. Now, as I mentioned, in this essay, Redfield is concerned with an analysis of the principal elementary juridical or proto-legal institutions. This is what the object of legal anthropology should be in this context. And of course, as I mentioned, legal anthropologists as Bohanan and Robert Lowy, who was writing several decades before this volume was published, were interested in this question. There is what are the foundations of the law and which principles we can define as basic or elementary or what are the proto-legal institutions. Now, of course, as the author says, as Robert Redfield says, what we can define as rudimentary law can, can be found in various institutions which uh, modern societies have. Rudimentary law can be found, can also be found in various clubs or in societies, not societies as we understand this concept, but, but various societies, let's say, for instance, societies of students or societies of engineers, various trade unions and other kinds of societies, and of course, various associations which occur in complex societies. And here we can include a diverse range of such associations as the mafia or protection rockets, or perhaps a more pleasant and desirable example, associations of students in universities. Indeed, the mafia has its own rules rules of the game or what political anthropologist Frederick Bailey defined as pragmatic rules. Of course, Bailey draws an interesting or a provocative analogy between the practices of the Cosa Nostra and the various a, a not so transparent procedures which politicians in European and Western societies sometimes engage in. And he describes these practices as pragmatic rules, as against normative rules. Now, let us consider a first ethnographic example of rudimentary law, which comes from the Andaman, Andaman Islanders. This is a constellation of islands or a group of islands, the Andaman Islands, in the Andaman Archipelago, which is located in the northeastern Indian Ocean. This is part of the Union territory of India. This is a rather isolated region, even nowadays, and um, some people 
have been able to access this remote region, but it is described as a dangerous place. Right, yes, this example comes from Rodcliffe Brown's ethnography um, among the Andaman. Now the Andamanese, Andamanese natives provide a classic example of a society which is stateless and where there are no explicit rules or procedures for dealing with disputes. These, these natives had no means for composing disputes, for legally composing a dispute, giving substance to a dispute and placing it within the context. And of course, they had no sanctions for violence. Moreover, as Radfield writes, quarrels and destructive behavior were frequent in this community. Excuse me. All right, yes. Uh, I was just looking at the recording. I hope that this has been recorded properly. Right. And um, there were no sanctions for violence. And moreover, as moreover, as he writes, quarrels, quarrels and destructive behavior were frequent. This is an impressive aspect of this part of the text because the author mentions that. This impulse for destructiveness sometimes was detrimental for the um, communal property at, at large, for society at large. Sometimes people who were in a situation of rage, they were enraged. They would uh, assault their neighbors, or they would destroy the property which belonged to other people. There were no authorities for intervention, nor any formal procedures of compensation by which the injured parties could secure revenge or some kind of payment, some kind of compensation. In this context, Personalized revenge and violence was the norm. The king of murdered persons would resort to private vengeance. Moreover, sorcery was a problem, as it used to be in these native societies, or in many of them. Sorcery among the Andaman Andamanese was recognized as a reprehensible act, but no measures were undertaken, no measures were taken against a sorcerer. This leads us to an interesting conclusion about procedures of dealing with, um, uh, with crimes and with offensive behavior in such a stateless society or in any stateless society where no explicit methods for dealing with such problems exist. One interesting or uh, an interesting definition of the law in this context involves various diffuse sanctions or public opinion. There is the power, the force, the impact of public opinion in terms of regulating individual conducts and making people define their own behavior accordance to what is advantageous for them. Therefore, these diffuse sanctions, as for instance, public opinion, emerge as a surrogate for law and courts of law in indigenous societies. They substitute for law and courts of law. Right, yes. Now, the case of the um, Andaman Islanders is contrasted to the Zuni Indians. This was a highly developed society, as the author writes. Excuse me. Uh, yes. All right. Yes. Excuse me. Right. Yes. The Zuni Indians, if we look into another example, were a highly developed society. They had 
complex rituals. And in this context, they also had elaborate ideas about fines, about fines and about various kinds of penalty and punishments. Secular fines were uh, given to various people and also there were religious methods of punishing people, delinquents in performances. This means that if a person misbehaved during a ritual performance, if, this, if a solemn ritual was being violated in this way, then, um, they, then, then this individual would be punished according to uh, their custom in this case. Moreover, among the Zuni, there were functionaries who could bring a formalized procedure to bear upon delinquents. Nonetheless, as the author says, the Zuni Indians were quite um, um, law-abiding citizens, we can describe them like that, and they had a strong dislike for delinquency, for controver controversy, as well as for conspicuous behavior, and by extension, by extension for arrogance. Let me just look into the text, because this is a very interesting case. Yes, they had a tribal organization and also they had functionaries. These functionaries are invested with authority on behalf of the tribe and may bring a formalized procedure to bear upon delinquents, as I mentioned. It appears that among the Zuni Indians, there was an ethos which prescribed that people should be equal to each other and no man should stand above another man in terms of display or in terms of showing an arrogant attitude or anything else which is socially condemned and disapproved of. Therefore, as the author writes, among the Zuni, a man is not supposed to stand up for his rights. He is looked down upon if he gets into any sort of conflict or achieves notoriety. The best that one Zuni may say of another is that he is a nice, polite man. Politeness is an ideal in this context. Yes, nonetheless, we shall read some other cases, as for instance, they Plains Indian tribes, or some of them, uh, the Cheyenne in particular, who had a completely different mindset, or a rather different mindset. Right, yes. Yes. Now, as I said, there is an important argument which emerges from this presentation. And this argument is that there is a sort of continuity between indigenous societies and modern societies. Perhaps the authors who put forward this, these arguments on, on primitive legal customs and on proto-legal rules were influenced by evolutionism, a theory which uh, explains social development in terms of stages, societies are simpler and they become more complex in the course of time. A seminal argument in this evolutionist paradigm is Henry Main and his study of the evolution of law, ancient law, a study which, um, a study which um, shows or which argues that ancient societies were based on kinship and in the course of time they developed such ideas as possessing a common territory and occupying a sort of legal system, a transition from status to contract. Right, so Robert Redfield's 
argues, as I mentioned, that in these indigenous societies we find the basic constituents of modern legal systems. We find what he defines as rudimentary legal institutions. Moreover, he says that in these examples we can discern a sort of systematization of the retaliative sanctions. Sanctions become retaliative, retaliatory, and this is a basic feature of law in complex societies or in political societies. In some of these indigenous societies, we find that these principles are in effect, namely that there is a body of rules, but that these rules are systematized and that they are compatible with kinds of offense. It is as though these native peoples had in their minds a book of delicts and offenses and they applied a given punishment to a particular kind of violation, a kind of offense. This system checks, controls personal drives for retaliation. It allows retaliation, but still it defines the context for retaliatory action. Right, yes, what we find in these examples is that Primitive law anticipates legal procedures, which we find in complex systems. There is, we find some proto-legal ideas on settlement, on payment, indemnity, and on compensation. These ideas are fixed. These ideas on payment, on indemnity, are fixed according to classes of delicts, a sort of classification of delicts is present in these indigenous societies. It is, part of, it is part of the oral tradition. An example which illustrates this is the Yurok Indians in Northern California. This comes from Kraber. This example provides an instance of a society with a well-defined code of compensation yet without any formal procedure for punishing delinquents or for righting a wrong done, done uh, to an individual. As Krabber writes, every invasion of privilege and property must be exactly compensated in this society. Uh, a nice example which I have um, identified in this account is the following one, which concerns divorce. If a couple with children separated, the woman could take them with her only on full, only on full repayment of her original purchase price. Therefore, a woman should return to her husband the uh, sort of compensation which the husband had paid to her family when they got married, the sort of the, the bride wealth which he had offered to um, his wife's family. By contrast, by contrast, if a man beat his wife, if a man beats his wife, the latter may take refuge in her parents, who might let her return to her husband, provided that he pays certain damages. Right, so um, we find that ideas which are part of modern legal systems, such as ideas on um, procedures for divorce, are also present in these systems of customary law. Yes, right. I shall mention a few more examples from the Yurok Indians of Northern California. And this example concerns cases of murder. If a person kills a man of social standing, they the indemnity was 15 strings of dandelion with perhaps a red 
a red obsidian, and a woodpecker scalp headband. Yes, besides handing over a daughter. Right, yes. Um, this shows that there were explicit and elaborate codes of conduct, and also there were well-defined kinds of penalty and compensation. This points to something interesting, and I shall close this exposition by telling some things about the final parts from the text by Robert Redfield, which is very interesting. This concerns elementary forms of courts of law, which are a sort of proto-state. Redfield presents a very interesting definition of the state and of state formation. He wrote a book on the origins of the state, which was published in the 1920s. I am familiar with this book through other works, but it is interesting to mention what he says about the origins of the state as such. He provides a definition of the state in that part which I've read in Robert Redfield's summary of these works. And he says that the state can emerge in various contexts. The state can emerge in the context of a lineage. And this implies that state conditions, state conditions are not dependent on a given on, on population size, but conditions which we define as a state, a sort of organization which involves rules of conduct and kinds of punishment may also exist within the context of a lineage or any other kind of kinship group. But in any case, in these elementary forms of courts of law, which we have reviewed in the several examples which I mentioned, we find the, the basic origins of what we call states. Now, the example which I would like to mention, and I shall shortly close with this example, comes from the Plains Indian tribes. There is a book by, there are several works, classical works on the Indian peoples. Uh, one of these books, which is a collection of essays, is by Adamson, Adamson Kebel. And this book focuses on the indigenous peoples in the um, plains of the United States, the Plains Indian tribes. Right, these peoples had a, some of these people, some of these tribes, and of course the term tribe is not in use nowadays, but um, it is used in a way which denotes tribal social organization. These tribes, these ethnic units, had very simple tribal, had very simple social organization and court procedures. Disputes are dealt with at the level of individual by means of personal retaliation or at the level of clan, at the level of bands and at the level of soldier society. Just a moment, please, 1819. Yes, there are all kinds of examples. Now, Lowy mentions an institution in these societies which he defines as military societies. By military society, we're referring to an association, to a group of people. Membership to this group is based on common features manhoods, a, a experience in war. These were warriors, essentially. These military societies or soldier societies consisted of warriors. These warriors exercised policing functions on behalf of the entire group, on behalf of the entire tribe. But the authority of these groups was largely limited in uh, the circumstances of collective hands. Lowy has made a study of these military societies. I would like to find his book and read more about 
these um, soldier or warrior societies, they are, as he says, and I'm reading from the book, they are the police and the law court acting not simply for one clan, but for a tribe made up of familial groups in a very simple form. As I said, the jurisdiction of these, of these groups was limited to contexts of collective hunting. Their power involved corporal punishment, inflicting corporal punishments, um, uh, and even confiscation of the game of the animals illegally secured. In this case, these, these uh, chiefs, all these warriors, this group of soldiers who uh, exercised this kind of policing were looking into the hunters. They surveyed the procedure of hunting. And if somebody killed an animal well in advance of the scheduled time for hunting, or if somebody broke the rules, they would intervene and they would inflict a punishment in this context. Right. Yes. Now the author mentions an interesting incident which uh, led to a, a trial and a punishment. Right, yes. In this context, in this context, if somebody violated a rule, if somebody inflicted an injury on another person, which is what this case is about, a young man injured a, an elderly person, and this was a serious offense, of course, in this case, the delinquent regretted, was regretful, and he was instructed to present five horses to the society of warriors in atonement. This was the punishment, the compensation which was arranged in this case. Moreover, we find, and I shall close with this, I shall develop this in our next section. We find that the supernatural plays an important role in regulating the social order. Of course, one of the most famous studies in this context is Evans Pritchard's book on witchcraft, oracles and magic among the Azande. This is not, of course, a legal anthropological study, but it provides a very nice picture, a detailed picture of how earthquake, there is an earthquake going on. Right, I'm still alive and well, well, this happens. <laughs> All right, thanks very much. Um, there have been some earthquakes over the past days. Well, thanks very much for attending this session. And well, this was an eventful session. Right, thanks very much and have a nice day.